Thank you very much. Uh, I, have few, I have to start with a few apologies. The first, of course, is apologizing for the late start. I blame poor chairing in the session immediately before. I think so, yes. I think that's uh, right. The second is when we booked my tickets for this, we thought there was the off chance that the UK would be leaving the European Union with no deal at 11 o'clock tonight. So the prospect of me trying to fly home tomorrow sounded like a really bad idea. That means I've got a, a cab up arriving in an hour and I'm making okay. a sprint for the door. When I leave uh, running in, a, in haste, it does not mean I was offended by anything you said. It just means I've got a plane to catch. The third is this is a little bit half-baked. I discovered yesterday that I was doing this. So let's see what happens. Uh, power. The first thing I would say about power is, remember, I come at this as a lawyer. And one of the things about your own discipline is, of course, you realize how irrelevant it basically <coughs> is. Certainly, we can research what happens to people when they're, for example, and remember I do psych psychosocial disabilities, when they're detained. But we also know that that's the tip of a very large iceberg. Excuse me, it's not actually a good marker of whether people are being controlled or not. Coercion doesn't line up with legal criteria very much. We know that lots of people <coughs> who aren't detained don't feel they have any options and are being forced into stuff. We know that at least some people who are detained don't feel particularly pressured at all. So that leaves the question of what do we think power is and how do we study it? My position, and it's interesting, I'll be interested to see how this works. We may be sort of bailing water into each other's canoes here. Um, my position would be that actually the sociologists and the crit theorists more or less have it right. When we're talking about power, you're talking about relationships between people where choice is problematized or as choice is problematic. When you articulate it that way, it's both easy and hard to analyze. It's easy if what you, excuse me, easy. It's doable if what you mean is we're going to look at individual situations and look at how relationships work <clears throat> in those individual situations. It's much harder if you want to generalize beyond those general situations, which of course as a lawyer is what I need to do because frankly if everybody agrees what's supposed to happen, you don't have a problem. That's not so much usually a human rights issue. Where you get a problem is where one person wants one thing and somebody else wants something else. And when does that become coercive? And how do we control that? If what we're talking about is relationships between individuals, well, you can get some of the really crude power games, and you can identify those and figure out how to deal with them. I suspect, and I can come up with some examples if people want later in the session, usually what you're talking about is much more complex than that. And figuring out the lines between coercion, power, choice, all of those questions becomes a lot more difficult and a lot harder to figure out how you draft a statute to control. And in the end, as a lawyer, that's my problem. Thank you. Never ask a sociologist never to ask talk about... Sociologist. Never ask a sociologist. <laughs> to talk. You're wrong! That is a terrible thing to say. Don't ever never ask a sociologist to talk about power or you could be here for several weeks or months. Okay, um, okay so I think that from my perspective, and obviously there are sociologies, critical sociologies, not just one, but I'm very informed in my thinking by the work of the... Um, the social philosopher Michel Foucault. And so I don't just think about power in the lives of disabled people in terms of um, coercion or domination, for example, um, but something far more 
um, complex and also various subtle ways in which play, um, power plays out in people's lives at the quotidian, at the everyday um, level. And I agree with Peter very much that we need to understand power in a relational manner. I think that's incredibly important. And I think that for me, power in disabled people's lives derives from its ability to function through knowledge and desire, discourse of norms and normality, which people through socialization processes and, and others are taught to desire and come to desire and want, and which can be part of the disablement process as people internalize these ideas and these norms, which are become quite regulatory, I think, in our, in our lives, all of us, and which in many ways we might say are disabling of everybody, but, it, but particularly acutely of disabled people. And I'm talking here about a concept that I like very much from Robert McCrure, compulsory able-bodiedness. Mm -hmm. right. I think this is a very useful idea to think about the power in society that is, you know, much of the world, in fact, the whole world is based around um, some mythical notion of able-bodiedness, which is also cross-cut with um, notions of masculinity and so on. It, it, it may be of interest to, to some of you, anecdotally, this is just a funny thing, but if you look at some dictionaries and you look up able-bodied, I recommend that you do. And there's one very well-known English language dictionary called the Longman Dictionary, and you know how sometimes, as well as giving you definitions of a term, it'll also have a sentence um, about how you use this word, how you can use it. And the sentence about able-bodiedness in the Longman Dictionary reads like this. It says, the able-bodied man fights for his country. Hmm? Okay. So the entanglement of notions of able-bodiedness with masculinity, with na nationhood... Um, with violence, it's very interesting to unpack. Okay, so I'm interested basically in what we might call a disability dispositif. Okay, and that is one of those words that again sociologists will have a habit of using. But what do I mean? I mean the various institutional, physical, administrative mechanisms and knowledge structures which enhance and maintain exercise the exercise of power within the social body right and these are often subtle they're often not easily visible to us and yet they are operating and a few years ago um, Dan Goodley and I were doing some work around ableism together and I hope you'll just forgive me for, for one moment. I'm just going to read a little some snippet that explains really my thinking around power and, and ableism. And this is what we wrote. We said, hitherto, our research in disability studies has engaged with the practices of disabilism, the exclusion of people with physical, sensory, cognitive impairments, etc. Bodies, technologies, and so on. But recently, disability research on embodiment has become more mindful of these wider processes of ableism, which include a host of psychological, social, economic, cultural, technological, imaginary, and we're talking about the social imaginary here, conditions that privilege normative ways of living, promote an idealization of able-bodiedness, cherish particular kinds of personhood over others, um, value certain kinds of psychological health over others, spatially organise environments around some normative citizen, create institutional biases towards autonomous, independent bodies, as if they ever really exist, and which feed into and off neoliberal and advanced capitalist forms of production. And importantly, this is what we felt as well, that those processes cannot be disentangled, those processes around ability and normativity, from other idealised discourses around whiteness, masculinity, entrepreneurship, independence, labour, responsibility, accountability, and so on. So for me, as the sociologist, when I think about power, power is everywhere. Right. But there's one final thing before it sounds too depressing. Mm. 
right? What did Foucault say? He said, resistance is prior to power. And everyone goes, really? How is this possible? Right. Well, because what he's arguing is that, yes, there will be some times where there is complete domination, but actually, do you know what? They're very small and very few. So in order that we can identify a power relation, there may be an imbalance of power, but there will always be the capacity to resist. And so what I'm interested in when I think about power is also the power and the resistance together, how we understand those and how we facilitate resistance as well. Yeah, so that's, that's my contribution to power. Okay, thinking. Gracious me, thank you very much. <clears throat> uh, along with my two esteemed researchers and, uh, and colleagues and academics, um, I too have been researching power in the context and the space of disability for, for some decades. And um, the kind of comments that have been made um, by both, both of my colleagues or comments, certainly comments that I uh, understand and appreciate. And um, I've come, however, I think it was earlier this morning, <laughs> to, to a counterposing, a countervailing thought, which I just want to set out. Um, because people with disabilities live in the world in which we exist now and are subject to the same forces and manipulations and uh, coercions and uh, influences that all of us are. They are part of us, we are part of them. Um, and if we do keep a mind of what our world is like these days, I want to draw out a political philosophy distinction which is um, um, old school, I have to admit, but then again, I'm ancient, so it's appropriate for me to be old school. We used to distinguish power and authority. Yes. And the distinction between power and authority is power is characterized in various ways, but authority is slightly different. Authority is, we might say, legitimate power, or if you're religious, righteous power, and if you're political, democratic power. We used to say in the old days, power to the people. We're talking about power that has a, a legitimacy that is constituated by the fact that it is contributory equal, and participatory, and transparent, probably, as well. So the notion of authority raises above power into a context in which it is primarily located in institutions. Institutions like the law itself, uh, like yes. civil society, like government, states, the press, the institutions that uh, are, exist around us. and. Not, not to be hysterical about it, although I tend to be hysterical about the political context we're living in. It's there is a cynical somehow. attempt to merge power and authority. And it is right out of, classically out of the autocratic playbook. So when we have Trump, Erdogan, Orban, Bolasero, Duarte, Boris, I could go Johnson. on and on. Boris, Boris Johnson. Johnson. Thank you. Uh, he's, he's too funny to be an autocrat. He's but not funny. No. He's yeah, not okay. funny. Okay. What are these people doing? <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 want, I want to deconstruct their activities because what they're doing in part is saying, come on, at the end of the day, it's just power. I have it, you don't. So if you want it, you grab it. There is no such thing as authority. There's no such thing as legitimate power, those institutions, everyone's in the same game, and it just so happens I happen to be on top of it. And there is no sense in which you can criticize me normatively, because at the end of the day, there is no normative position to, to take, because it's all a matter of grunt power, and I happen to have it and you don't. And it's in context of money, the context of military power, the rest of it. So, in that context where we are living, and it is not and not a secret, a eh? and it's not something that we can just comic view as a comic uh, turn, because although all of these people are, are in a sense comical, especially Trump, but anyway, uh, uh, comical, they also are on the cusp of brutality, and the move that they're making is, I think, in part to say, yes, it's all power, that's the game and your job is to get it. Now, I think 
in part that that's a wrong move. And I think what we should take more seriously in the disability movement and as disability scholars and researchers is empowerment. What we should be looking at is trying to legitimize the use of power. And I think, and I, this is the, the nagging thought I have which isn't developed, that it has to also be in the terms of the of institutions. At some point, a respect for an institution which sounds uh, in a Foucault term to be absolutely, <laughs> absolutely the wrong direction. There is an element in which I think institutions can embody authority in the proper sense of that and can be empowering if po properly used. Now it may be both a liberal and the enlightenment um, prejudice that is um, long since discredited and and uh, comically and, and in a sense uh, something which we deride. But I do want to remind you that the direction in which you turn when you deride reason, fact, science, normativity, which I would add to the list, and truth is an equation of legitimacy of authority and power. And that is precisely the opening move of an authority, authoritative state. I think we can, in our research, focus more not on power as a constraint of choice, but on legitimacy as we're all in it together. This is our world. This is our state. This is our law and we're participating equally in it. We share power. We are empowered by our institutions, our participation. There is no way to end what I'm saying, so I will stop. <laughs> I, I needed a, you know, yeah, but I didn't have you it. Can, I didn't I have think it. you had it, yeah. okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, given that we're short of time, I'm not sure I'll give you the personal story. It's a classic personal story about my husband had a serious operation. A number of us were providing support for that, and it's a really good, in a proper Foucauldian sense, set of questions about where was power lying. Um, the good news is he's fine. He agrees with what we did, certainly after the fact. Indeed, thinks it was all his idea, so that's sounds promising on all levels. Going through it, it was much more complicated about where choice lay, how that developed. So it is, and you know, he, as it happens, he doesn't have a disability. Maybe part of the question there, which lurks in the background, one of the things I do worry a little bit about with our CRPD research is our assumption, assumptions as to how the rest of the world operates. So we seem to have a set of beliefs about how consent treatment works for everybody else. That wasn't my experience in my husband's care. Yes, of course he could refuse and there was no legal trump card. He wasn't going to refuse. Just me and me mates were going to make sure that he was going to be supported through this and the right decision, wrong decision, abuse of power, not abuse of power, 12-4 of the CRPD talks about undue influence. Was that undue influence or just influence? Or do we mean that in a very strictly legal sense, because of course for those of you that are lawyers, undue influence has a specific meaning. And again, that becomes sometimes quite difficult or complicated to research. Another really nice example, or interesting example, is one of my psychiatric colleagues who, <clears throat> for those of you that are uh, from the UK, had his Section 11 status revoked. What that meant was he couldn't any longer serve as a second opinion doctor to admit people to hospital. The reason for that is we have a rule about how many people you have to admit in order to keep your sec Section 11 status up. That makes some sense when you realize that what was happening is people were doing one about every three years and were completely out of touch with everything and this seemed like a bad idea. In his case it was re uh, revoked because 
he'd go around and talk to people, and after having a chat with them, they went in voluntarily. Is that why we would want to evoke someone's status? If they were really going in voluntarily, that has to be brilliant, right? What we want is for pe people to decide what treatment they want and decide how to get it. Do we really think that it was that voluntary? I think that's an interesting problem. The other example I'll give you is one of the risks of this sort of event is we tend to get people who talk a lot about qualitative research and not people who talk about quantitative research. I was chatting with a mate over the weekend who has a quantitative research problem. They're halfway through a study getting the data in and he works, uh, his job is uh, the service user lived experience coordination of that. The view of the, uh, the people with lived experience is, as it turns out, for reasons nobody had expected, the measures for this quantitative data are probably not the right measures. They don't think that their experience is being adequately reflected by the measures that were chosen for the study. This is a problem which doesn't arise usually in the same way with qualitative stuff because qualitative stuff, you just build that in and develop your questions, right? Quantitative stuff, it's very hard to go back and reinvent that. It's a really interesting problem because there's not much wiggle room necessarily for the people who set up the study. But at the same time, if you're doing a power analysis, the people with lived experience have the power because if they go on strike, the study collapses. And those of you that are interested in that, there's some quite interesting stuff during the HIV crisis in the 80s, 1980s in particular, of where the patients went, or the people with AIDS went on strike, said, we're not doing these trials until you change the system. And guess what? We thought about, all of a sudden the system changed. So again, very interesting questions of how power works in those situations. The HIV one's particularly interesting because of course the people with HIV desperately wanted some really good research and some really good outcomes. But equally, we're not prepared to trade away their mates on that. Over to you. Yeah. Oh, thanks. I'm going to just begin by responding a little bit to you, but also then I have a, a grounded example of some research that I mm. think um, may take us away from some of that more theoretical discussion and ground it. Um, just an observation that I think this is why um, there's two things to say about um, quantitative work within disability studies. <clears throat> One is that um, we began really as very critical of some of the big statistical research that had been undertaken, which was um, part of the disablement process, in fact, um, leading to categorization, entangled with eugenicist movements. I mean, um, Leonard Davis has written brilliantly on the role that statistics has played in constructing um, disability as a, as a form of oppression. But I think you're not wrong that there is scope for us to do more research quantitatively. But with regard to the issue of not having the right questions and discovering it later on, mm. I have to say in defence of the quality researchers that that's why a mixed methods approach has come in because one would hope that one would begin by working uh, more inductively um, through a qualitative um, mechanism in order to derive the right questions before you begin. So that's just, um, that's, sorry, that's the methodologist mm, in me, no, can't let that go. Um, so yeah, that's a problem that should really not they happen. Did. Well, there you go, it's, they can't yeah. have got that quite right, I think. So I think that the other points I was going to say is to ground what I was talking about earlier about knowledges and their relationship to power and disciplines. So an example would be my, the work I've been doing on um, play for disabled children. Now, um, 
I know we have an audience here of lawyers as well who want, so I'm, I'm going to do my bit now and, and relate this now. So Article 30 of the CRPD, she names one, um, <laughs> Article 31 of the CRC, General Comment 17, go and read them, it's really important on the CRC. But by and large what I want to point out here is that the way in which play has been framed and articulated for disabled children mm. is a problem okay it's a part of the problem now i've worked in interdisciplinary networks where we came together officially in order to enable play for disabled children and very very rapidly with 100 researchers we started finding that what various groups were doing was actually um, therapy via play um, rehabilitation via play and we kept saying no we mean play free play play that children determine that they enjoy that they feel that they have a control over and they do in a very real sense have control over why does this matter right well it matters because we actually know that that's the play that is most beneficial to the development ironically of children but also to their mental well-being right but when you get talking with educational psychologists, and I say that quite <coughs> blankly because really I have found this a difficulty, and occupational therapists, um, they want to turn play into something else, which is about normalization. It's about, you know, but this is also part of a wider discourse within society. Who's ever bought a child, gone into a toy shop and turned over the package of a toy? I, if you haven't, do. And what you will find is things like enhances motor skills, right? Really good for, for maths development, right? Are children not allowed to play, right? Without us, it fascinates me that I was Googling one day and I found that the central business organization, the CBI in the UK, is one of these random things you find on Google, had written something about children's play. And this I thought, I'm sorry, I have to look at this. Is it about the play industry? No, 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 no. It was about why we should be allowing children to play in order to develop their entrepreneurial skills. <laughs> right? Oi. Okay, right. Now, what we know for disabled children is that there is this there was this wonderful study conducted by a play theorist that showed that there are various rhetorics or discourses around play and the 20th century and the 21st century play has been about progress right we play in order to get better at this to be ready for that to be more prepared for the labor market right in some ways disabled children feel this most acutely why because either they're seen as play deficient. Google, there's loads of psychology literature, so I'm a sociologist, so immediately there's a, a problem. This is a bias between the two disciplines, where they're all like, this child is defective in terms of their play skills. How can we rectify this? Right. Or maybe we can use play as a vehicle to determine their deficiencies and then rectify them <coughs> and so on, right? So, the work that we've been trying to do is to actually liberate play for disabled children from those. Now I have to say looking at Theresia and hoping very much that the CRPD committee is not going to forget Article 30, especially in children's lives. This is where actually the CRC, I don't agree with them about everything around disabled children, but a few things they've done very well and there's a great general comment there which actually talks about the adulteration of disabled children's play, about the way that it has become inflected and infused with adult concerns and that we need to live. So this is what I meant by the ways in which there was, a, there was another study, a public inquiry in the UK into play for disabled children under five. And when they talked to parents, a worrying number of parents said, sorry i'm sorry why are you asking us about play there's much le more it's not important we need to be talking about the re various medical regimes and therapies and and stuff okay so this was a problem and but there are like there are radical lawyers who ask questions like not oh no i'm sorry the, the law says this so no you can't ask that question you can't challenge that because the law says that's it is it the right law 
right? Well, there are also physiotherapists who say to parents, go home, take the child to the local swings, right? Okay, and stop asking me for equipment that strengthens the, the arm muscle. Go and have some fun. Speech and language therapists who I know in Malta who are saying, enough, they don't need three therapy sessions in a week, mum and dad. But what are mum and dad questing after? They're questing after normalisation. I don't blame them. In a disabling world, there'll be parents saying, won't it be easier for them in life if they have all these therapies? Yes, and until we change world and make it more accommodating of difference. But do you see, that's what work, I think, disability studies does. It highlights those problems, it explores them, and it, and it challenges all these different professional fields, disciplinary perspectives. It unsettles the knowledge bases of them. And it says, why do you assume that play must be purposeful? Psychologists, why? <coughs> right? And, wh and what is the consequence of thinking that way about things? So that's an example of how you take, I think, you know, I'm, I'm interested in ableism, but I'm also interested in disabled children having the right to play, and the two things are not <coughs> disconnected. Yeah. As the water slushes down our canoes, <laughs> great, I'll never forget that image. Uh, I want to uh, talk about a research. Um, uh, proposal, a uh, research project that I was doing um, and um, on what's usually called personal budgets. So it's um, um, an innovation in the how uh, service provision uh, is provided for uh, adults with intellectual and developmental disabilities uh, and various um, academics have sort of sculpted uh, the notion and the idea is you simply provide the individual themselves with the money and, and then they buy the services that they're interested in purchasing. Um, and this, in the academic literature, um, um, there's a lot of work. But uh, I, what I'm interested in this story is the, the implicit power issues that suffuse this, even research, but more importantly, implementation of the research. Um, in where where I do my research, we are very committed to implementation, um, which is not publishing articles, dissemination, but actually getting into the field. And if you have a good idea that arises from an evidence base, uh, as this policy does, then you track it, you, you identify it in, in the field and, and try to get it into place. Um, and I had the opportunity as a consultant for the State of Israel, who wanted to implement uh, direct payment, uh, modeled after what in uh, the country that Peter and I share, we share things. We're in different law schools, but we do share a country. Uh, um, uh, that is to say Canada and Ontario. In the Ontario system, they have something called the Passport Program. I don't know if Peter rec recognizes it. But the Passport Program is perhaps the most advanced version of um, what in UK is called direct payment. And it goes under various names. So anyway, I, w I was presenting to the Israeli government, the social services department, uh, this, this scheme. And as they began to implement, my job was to tr track the implementation. And what happened was a sort of a replay or a reprise of a power relationship that other academics had identified, but I was com completely forgot about. And that is, what happens is you put into effect a scheme that really depowers or decenters the power relationships between service provider, well, funders, service providers, and clients. And you shift it and you, you have the service providers as service providers, and the funders directly give money to, to the users. Uh, you, you end up creating, in practice, when you implement, three models. And the models actually have been written out, um, have been identified as professional monitoring professional assisting, and what's called user-directed uh, uh, funding. Uh, this, if you like, is how, when you implement, it turns out. What happens is people discover, when you give money to individuals without support, that they misuse the money, in, in the sense that they exhaust their budget within two days and find themselves struggling to have the services that they need, 
personal care or whatever service they need for the rest of the month. So budgeting is, is an issue. Um, in the so-called user directed, you play with the system, well, you play with the outcomes as they occur. And this is, in the old days, used to, used to be called the dignity of risk, we used to call, say, well, they screw it up, but everyone can screw things up. So allow them to play it out, and this is their right, the autonomy is autonomy, and if, if you give the money and they, and they you know, splurge it on, uh, on video games or whatever, that's their, that's their right to do so. That's often called the user directed. The opposite of that is the professional monitoring, which where you can immediately see where power is seeping in like a, like a sauce that's creeping through your, your, your um, pasta. And, and what it, the monitoring is, well, yes, that was an interesting purchase, but maybe next time they monitor, they oversee this, this and direct it in certain kinds of way through various, what in policy we call nudging relationships, where you say, that was nice, but have you thought of doing it this way? So you, you don't coerce, or you do in a milder form, but you direct it. So the professional is there monitoring the decisions. Now there's a middle ground called professional assistance, which those of you who know Article 12 will recognize it in the, in the disability context as supportive decision making. So the context of supportive decision making is where you provide people with the tools that they need to construct budgets, to, do, to actually empower them, to get back to an earlier discussion, to empower them to optimize their own preferences to optimize their own will and preferences. Not to change their will and preferences, but to optimize them. Uh, it's a subtle difference. The, the, the model that is created by professional monitoring changes wills and preferences. The user leaves them alone, but doesn't provide the support to optimize them. And the middle ground optimizes. So this, these power relationships, and what I think is the better way of proceeding, only comes out, not at the research level, but at the implementation level. Because you only see these things occurring when you start to put into place the lovely ideas that we sociologists and lawyers, and myself occasionally, create in principle, in theory. But when you implement it, you see how the power comes back into play. And how you have to navigate once again, you have to navigate that power relationship in more subtle, nuanced, concrete ways. And it's just an example which struck me as an interesting example of how the power, you can do your best, but once you get into the stage where you're making a difference in people's lives by implementing a good idea, you have to take care that in the implementation, those power relationships will potentially uh, come back in and affect it, and you have to, you have to engage at a further level. So that was my example. By the way, the uh, the NDA National Dis uh, National Disability Authority um, in this country has a fantastic report, actually, on personal uh, budgets and direct payments that uh, I recommend highly. So that was my example. <laughs>